Next one is high pressure ejectors. So now these ones here, you can use for larger systems. So the other ones I think went up to 20 kilowatts or 30 kilowatts, like 10 tons, I think it was. Uh, this one here, you can get up to 300 kilowatts or 85 tons. But one of the things that it, uh, Patrick said, you cannot use these on small systems. because They cannot take the full load of the evaporators. And you need, as you can see here, a parallel compressor with the, this design. Okay. And once again, we have our drop leg pressure going into the high pressure ejector. We have our medium temp suction going in there. And then we have our, our outlet going into the flash tank receiver. But in this design, which is a little different than the other one, you need that parallel compressor in, in the system. You'll see on the left-hand side here, you got some Corel ejectors. These are stepper ejectors. Little, they're a different design. And the, the top one there, I can't remember the name. This was, I think it's a Bitzer own company. I'll have to look that one up. But this is another type of high-pressure ejector. So these, these ejectors, once again, they're trying to reduce the amount of energy on the system. So when you're working in warm climates, it can, it can work fine. I'm seeing more and more of the different ejectors on what, heat recovery systems, on flooded systems. So they're out there. And there's some manufacturers that they put it on all their systems. So they're integrated in there because they know that it's a, there's a huge amount of savings when you're using CO2 with ejectors. Next, Here's the technology that I just recently learned about. I did a podcast with uh, Casey Chan. So it, it's a technology called PXG1300. And this here, this technology is pretty cool. I'm going to show you this video here in a second. On it was a quick shot that I took when I was down at Atmosphere America Summit. And getting a better understanding on these new technologies, because I know there's going to be more and more of these coming out, different strategies to reduce that amount of energy when it's in transcritical. So this one here, what it does, it replaces the, really the high pressure valve and the flash gas bypass valve. So it's replacing really that parallel compressor in a sense. What that means is now, now I'm not even using compression. I'm not using energy to run CO2 system. You're still going to have compressors. You know, you got your medium temp compressors, you're going to have your low temp compressor. But what this is doing is taking that high pressure gas and shooting out a low pressure gas on just a mechanical device. And I'm going to just watch this quick video. Okay. And as the high pressure gas comes in here, the high pressure gas goes into these little cylinders. As it spins, it takes that high pressure gas and then shoots it out here as a low pressure gas. And what that does, that will replace the high pressure valve. And then on this side, this side takes the low pressure gas that comes in here into these little cylinders and then shoots it out this side. And this is what really replaces, uh, not replaces, but reduces the amount of flash gas in your system acting like a parallel compressor. I think this is a pretty cool technology. This can be in retrofit or brand new application. What you need to do is go to energy recovery, check out this device, find out more. Let me know what you- Okay, so, so once again, now we're replacing parts that use energy or cost energy to, to run, because you got to take power from the grid to start a compressor, run the compressor. Now we're not using a compressor. And they got a few applications around the world. I know they've got a couple in Italy. They've got a couple in the US. But once again, this is a technology that I know manufacturers are testing this and testing it on their systems to see if they can build a system with it. This can be used for retrofit. This can be added on to a CO2 system. So, okay. So this is the FTE and the ET technology. This here, one is a high ambient or warm ambient strategy. And one's a flooded evaporator strategy. So you got to check out the podcast that I did with Ignacio. Hands down, you're going to learn so, so much in that se uh, section. But we dive into it, the mechanical subcooling side. What's cool about what they, they did, they're not using an external unit because a lot of the units that I've seen out there already, they have a, a 134A system or 404A system that was added on uh, to the system. And you can't use those ones anymore now, but the ones that I've seen uh, before the regulations and stuff, but this is all a one system CO2. So now we got the mechanical subcooling. And really what you're trying to do is that, that drop leg, leaving that gas cooler, you're cooling that line. So you're cooling the CO2 fluid that's coming down that line because it, it's super critical when you're in trans transcritical fluid coming down there. And what this 
mechanical subcooling is doing, it's cooling that line. So by the time it gets to the high pressure valve, you have less flash gas. And that's, that's the big thing. You have less flash gas going into your high pressure valve. That high pressure valve doesn't have to work as much. It doesn't have to drop the pressure as much. So you get more liquid when, you, when you're coming out of that than flash gas. And that's a really key to getting warm ambient strategies to reduce the amount of energy a system's running. So now I got cooler liquid in my flash tank and cooler liquid means more efficiency. Like if you think about subcooling, if you have low temp applications, you got good subcool and it's less work on those evaporators. And that's what it's going to be doing here. Less work on the, the medium temp compressors. The other one that we talked about is the flooded evaporator. This is not really a warm ambient solution, but I'm seeing more and more of this globally. Ignacio dives into it really well, getting a better understanding that now you're increasing that medium temp pressure. So you get you get a lower superheat in those medium temp evaporators. And when you have a lower superheat, that means you can raise the pressure up. You're going to pull out more uh, energy or heat out of the product. So once again, now we can get that smaller pressure ratio or smaller compression ratio on the compressors. And I'm pretty sure is that every one PSI, you can increase the suction is like two, almost 2% 2 efficiency gain. So that's, that's huge amount of gain. Look into that stuff. What is that value you're bringing to that your customer? And that's the big thing. What value you bring into your customer with these different technologies? Regulations is pushing this really hard. So we're going to continue to see regulations, but I really want to get to the point where more people want to embrace and use this because it is CO2 is a better refrigerant than a lot of refrigerants out there. And as more and more people start to embrace it and, and use it and work on it, more and more people are going to be comfortable. More and more people are going to, going to, going to want to get trained on it. And you got to spend the time to invest in doing and looking at these strategies. So this one, that's five or six different strategies we talked about. We talked about the adiabatic cooling, mechanical subcooling. We just talked about uh, low pressure ejector, high pressure ejectors, the, the PXG1300, um, which is a cool technology. I like that. Uh, as well as uh, low, low evaporator temperature. That's not really a high ambient or warm ambient strategy, but it's something else that can reduce the cost when you're running, um, when you're running your system in transcritical, well, I guess the low, the, actually the low or the flooded system or low superheat systems, they, they run year round. So there's a savings year round with those systems where the other ones like adiabatic cooling, mechanical subcooling, those ones are really when it's hot out, when you're in transcritical, when it's 45 Celsius out, when it's 110, 120 Celsius out. And it's important to invest in yourself and, and grow your knowledge. We have tons of CO2 programs here at Refrigeration Mentor. We do introductions to CO2 trainings where we spend, we do a four or six, eight week program where we dive into giving you the understanding of how to grow. And I see a lot of you on this call now that you've been coming week over week. We're, I don't even know how many months now. It's been so many, 70 or 80 weeks we've been doing this. But you want to dive into these trainings, introductory. Get into a service and troubleshooting program. This is where you dive in to troubleshoot the high pressure valve, electronics, how to work on a system, how to read a diagram, how to read a legend, refrigeration letter, understand how to match that wiring diagram up to the piping schematic. I talked about this already. You want to get better at CO2 or commercial refrigeration, supermarket refrigeration. You need to put the work in. You got to spend the time and implementing. A lot of my, why I do the programs that I do, I do virtual programs. I do mentoring and coaching. I talk to the, to the techs and the engineers is that is because they're the experts out there. I was out in the field with them. If they can, if you can take what I teach you and implement it in the field, that's game changer. This is why I can tr train people in Australia, in the UK, anywhere in Canada, in the U S anywhere in the world is because if you can go and implement the practices that I talk about, how to be safe out there, how to electrically troubleshoot, how to go and understand how to where to start on a control system. That's when the game changes happen. But you got to get into these programs. You got to invest in yourself. You got to grow your knowledge. And then you got to get into the specific controller trainings. So you got to go look up if it's microthermal, if it's E3, if it's if it's Corel, you got to get into those. If it's 
on the electronic valve. You got to have those specific trainings and all the manufacturers do trainings as well, specific to their equipment where, which is great. And you got to take those as well, where I'll train on anyone's equipment. If that's what you need, whatever you need, is that what we're going to do and walk through what I see a lot of, especially the technicians that have eight to 10 years experience working in supermarket, what they want to understand is how to be safe, how to take an on-call service call and how to take CO2 service calls. Cause they have most of these guys after and, and girls, after they take this train, like a CO2 training program, they're like, man, this is super easy. It's a bit more complex. I got a bit more controls, but I know where to start now. And I know what the processes that I need to take because I haven't been shown that because I wasn't showing that stuff either. And in these programs, that's what we dive into. I also got one on design and engineering. And so if you're a designer and engineer and you're looking to learn how to design a CO2 system with a gas cooler or with the compressors, electronic valves, things like that, there's course, we'll do courses on that here at Refrigeration Mentor. But we have lots of different things to help your business help you grow. So if you work for a manufacturer, we can help train your team at manufacturing. If you work for a contractor, we can help train you or your contracting team. If you're a distributor or a wholesaler and you need to understand how CO2 works, we can, that would be like the introductory program. All right. So we have lots of options here at Refrigeration Mentor to help you. I say first step is getting into the mastering CO2 on my YouTube channel or listen to the podcast like you're doing right now. So thank you for doing that. But get in and start looking at that. I have some of the top CO2 experts around the world. This is why I'm so good. at. This is why I'm awesome at training CO2s because I've been trained by the best and I continue to learn from the best and grow my knowledge so I can share it with you. That's why when you come into these programs, it's going to be different. If you took it a year ago, it's going to be different this year than last year because I'm adding stuff that I see out there that these technicians need when I get to the more advanced CO2 programs because it's continually evolving. I see CO2 condensing units starting to grow out there. There, There's more and more manufacturers making CO2 condensing units. Do they cost a lot more? Yes, they cost a lot more. But as the time goes by, you're going to start to see this price start to, to come down. As you start to see more manufacturers building these equipment, the price is going to come down. And then as regulation starts to push it a little bit harder, you'll start to see more and more natural refrigerant, low GWP solutions uh, coming out. And it's just, you got to invest the time to be better at what you do and learn a bit more so you can finish those jobs quickly. So you can design those more efficiently, more effectively. It's a lot of fun. Lastly, like I said, check out some of the CO2 learning programs that we have. You can reach out to me, shoot me an email, let me know, get to my website, go to the contact page and find out refrigerationmentor.com. I got on a course is coming up. I always got an advanced compressor course. I always got a, a supermarket course. And I always got a fundamentals of CO2 course that happen really quarterly. You need to get into these programs to, to get better at what you do. You need to get into them. You need to invest in yourself. I want to thank you for taking the time to learn a little bit about warm ambient strategies on the steps that you need to take for implementing those, because at the end of the day, you're going to have to work with your customer on this. Even if like, even if you're a field service, you got to go in and talk with the customer about the solutions that they have. So they have a better understanding and you got to talk about it in plain English. I see, I've seen many salespeople and uh, managers go out and talk and, and to the end user and they're on different playing fields. You need to go out and give them an understanding of what, because the price is higher. Complexity is higher. These systems can be harder to work on. So what's the value for the end user? So you got to understand what the value is. I've been to training. I understand how to service, install, commission these systems. These are the things we're going to look for. I can, I can dial up to your systems. When I do, do I'm going to let you know on the different things that you need to look at. And you got to work with your customer on it because we talked about warm ambient uh, solutions. CO2 is new to them. All these solutions are going to be even newer to, the, to a lot of them. And they're just going to continue to become more relevant as they see the more supermarkets is growing. I think there's over 2000, almost 2000 in North America, nothing close to what's going on in Europe where there's tens, 50, I think there might be over 60,000 different trans critical ones in, in Europe and in the rest of the world. But we're going to see that these numbers double and triple as the years go on and more and more of them as well as potential complexity. There are manufacturers that I've been dealing with that are trying to reduce the complexity. So I know there's 
I, I, I deal with uh, Arneg, great manufacturer here out of Quebec, and they designed a system, one of their systems for smaller stores that has one electronic valve in it on, on the pack itself. That's huge compared to usually having like, say four or five, you know, for sure you'd have the high pressure valve and the flash gas pipe valve. They just have the, the one uh, high pressure valve. So you're going to see more designs coming out with less and less components on it to make it easier to work on. Lots of cool stuff. I want to thank you for taking the time to learn a little bit more about CO2, these warm ambient strategies. If you have any questions, always reach out. Leave a comment, leave a review on Apple or Spotify. This is how more people find out about this because there's a lots of people that don't know about Refrigeration Mentor. They don't know about CO2 refrigeration. And by you sharing this, by you leaving reviews and comments, it really helps other people find out about it, that there's a ton of content out there. And I do a lot of this for free right now, doing this for free, not getting paid to do this stuff. I'm doing this because I know the industry needs this. And I want to help more technicians, more engineers out there to get better at what they do, feel confident and feel comfortable when they're working on CO2 systems. That's why I do this because I was that technician one time that I didn't have a lot of comments. I didn't have anyone to turn to when I ran into issues and just figured it out and messed a lot of things up until I started to figure out and get it right. I got it right now. So I'm ready to help more people. Please share this. Once again, thank you so much for taking the time and we'll see you at the next CO2 Monday Refrigeration Mentor podcast.